In this video, we'll talk about the final uh, model of intertemporal choice, namely self-control, and we'll talk about a number of studies here. An initial study that was done by Michel et al. Uh, on children using the marshmallow test, which is quite famous. Then a longitudinal study looking at how childhood self-control predicts later uh, adult life outcomes. Uh, we'll move on to look at a TMS study on the DLPFC by Bernd Figner and colleagues. And then finally, we revisit the study by Herdal to look at the DLPFC in a neuroimaging study, sort of to provide converging evidence for the role of the DLPFC in self-control. But let's get started and talk about the Michel study. So this was, uh, this has come to be known as the marshmallow task. And I'm, pu I'm putting two links in your lecture notes, which you can then visit and have a look at how children in these types of tests perform. The idea behind the marshmallow test is basically that you give the children a sweet that they like, a marshmallow. Um, obviously, the children have to like that sweet to, um, for the test to work. And then you ask them to wait until the experimenter comes back. And if they can wait without eating it, then uh, they get a second marshmallow. So this is basically testing how uh, children are able to engage self-control and delay gratification thereby. And you can see the kids that are successful uh, apply a number of strategies. For instance, they look away um, or they start thinking about things in their head, but they sit there and they have, they have issues. Many kids have problems doing this test. Uh, about one third can wait for about a 50 minute period. And the, the difficulty here is it's ambiguous to the children. So they don't know when the experimenter comes back. And you can see this here that the, under different conditions, these are the uh, periods that children successfully wait on average and, and are able to delay gratification. Obviously, a number of children then fail and have uh, much briefer periods of time, but these are the averages here. For instance, in this condition, they're not very good. Um, when, when they were instructed to think about the reward in front of them, in that case, they basically break down right, um, quite quickly and start eating it. And this is also what you see in those videos. So they make these kind of grimaces here where they express how hard it is not to eat it. Uh, and some just simply start eating it, although they were instructed not to. So this has this is sort of like a, a nice test to identify self-control in children. Uh, but and, and it does have some predictive power uh, on later life outcomes. So so the the time that children can wait before they receive a second reward actually um, predicts later life outcomes. But this was done in a very uh, nice and controlled environment in this uh, more recent study called the Dunedin Mis Multidisciplinary Health and Development Study. And this is a longitudinal study where the children, about a thousand children were recruited, 1,037 at the beginning. You can see there's some dropout, but it's very little dropout. So they end up with 972 participants still, uh, when these kids that were born here in 72, 73 are 32 in the year of 2004. And that's a great um, rate of, of keeping the, the participants in the study. So when they were young, at the ages three to 11, they were assessing self-control, IQ and socioeconomic status. And self-control was assessed in many different ways, which I'll show you in a minute. Then during adolescence, they assessed the children at the well, years of 13, 15 and 18 and 21 to look at school dropout, teen parenthood and early smoking and drug taking. And finally, they assessed adult health at the ages of 26 and 32, looking at a number of, of health uh, issues they might have, but also adult wealth and adult crime. So how many of these kids that they looked at from birth onwards became criminals, for instance, or have a record. But let's have a look at the measures that they took in the early ages. So these measures were then basically averaged, sort of a, a composite score of this was formed. And they assessed lack of controls, impulsive aggression, hyperactivity at all of these different ages, lack of persistence, which is defined as a failure to finish tasks or being easily distracted, or the difficulty just sticking to activity. So it's kind of like a attention deficit. Impulsivity was assessed, which is an important aspect. Um, hyperactivity, inattention, and another measure of impulsivity here. 
So impulsivity is quite important. It comes up three times. And it's actually something that's been shown to be importantly involved in economic decisions involving risk or intertemporal choice. So let's have a look at a very uh, common measure of impulsivity to have some more intuitive understanding of what, what these types of measures measure. This is, uh, these are questions from the BIS-11, which is uh, a questionnaire or the most commonly used scale to assess impulsivity in adults, uh, mostly. So there are items here, such as I do things without thinking, and then you, um, as the subject, would rate your agreement on this, so your level of agreement from I don't agree at all to I agree very much, basically, so on a Likert scale. I have racing thoughts, I plan trips ahead of time, I concentrate easily would be a reverse coded one, so if you concentrate easily, obviously, then uh, you're not as impulsive. I save regularly, I act on the spur of the moment, I get easily bored when solving thought problems, I'm restless in theaters or lectures, and I'm future oriented. So you can see that these items are sort of measuring self-reported impulsivity, but the items that the uh, experiment included went beyond this, obviously, and also looked at ratings of parents and teachers and those kinds of things. So it's, it was they were very thorough, um, also not just in terms of the measures that they used, but also in terms of following their participants throughout the years. So it's a very well conducted study. Uh, and then what they did is they looked at this self-control composite measure, right? The composite measure is, is basically a summary of all of these different aspects that were measured during childhood. And they looked at how this predicts different aspects of health, wealth, as well as um, child rearing. Uh, this is all wealth, right? And public safety, so criminal conviction um, in adult during the adulthood right D during in adult ages and you can see that what even when controlling for socioeconomic status and iq low self-control is predictive of many of these aspects so physical health recurrent depression is not so much involved uh well there is a, a slight trend here right um substance dependence is related to self-control uh, informant reported substance problems which is another measure of substance dependence. Socioeconomic status is highly related to uh, self-control, right? Higher self-control leads to higher socioeconomic status. Income, obviously related to SES, uh, and many other financial aspects that are all that all show a significant association with uh, um, the self-control measure taken at childhood. So childhood self-control can predict many of these different outcomes. But let's have a look at this graphically. So this is basically the self-control gradient shown here uh, on the x-axis and then different outcomes z-scored on the y-axis. Um, these are health outcomes shown here. You can see higher self-control leads to better health. So um, less poor physical health, less substance dependence, etc. Uh, when it comes to wealth measures, you can see that high self-control leads to better socioeconomic status, uh, better financial planfulness and higher income, and less financial struggles, basically. Single parent is another con condition that they looked at. High self-control leads to predicts lower uh, chance of becoming a single parent or single uh, to end up rearing a child alone. And it also is associated with less adult criminal conviction. So self-control during childhood has quite high predictive uh, powers of, or is, it's associated with um, different health, wealth, single parent and criminal outcomes. There was a, a really interesting and well-conducted study by Figner et al. In, done in 2010 that looked at the neural basis of self-control in intertemporal decision-making. So they stimulated the bilaterally the DLPFC uh, shown here, the left and the right DLPFC using repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. In effect, what this does is it inhibits these regions. So these regions don't contribute as much as they could to the decision uh, when subjects are making these types of decisions. And there were two types of decisions that participants made. There were now trials involved in the study. So, 
the options were an immediate reward, such as, let's say, $20 that participants would receive immediately after the experiment is done, and a, a reward, 20, uh, let's say, $24 at some relatively small delay, like in a month from now or later. So these are just examples. They're not exactly the values that the experimenters used. And they had not now trials with uh, choices over um, two rewards that occurred at some delay. Again, with a smaller but sooner outcome and a later but larger outcome. And this, the, the difference between now and not now trials is that now trials involved an immediate smaller but sooner outcome. So what they found is after stimulating the right um, DLPFC, but not the left, there was a small but significant effect here on the proportion of patient choices. And specifically what happened is RTMS, so repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, reduced the proportion of patient choices, but only in the now trials. This did not occur in the not now trials, and this was gone about 30 minutes after RTMS. Right. So the way the experiment works is the experimenter stimulated uh, the right DLPFC. After stimulation, the participants then went through a number of trials with an inhibited DLPFC, and if the right um, DLPFC was inhibited, but not the left and not sham, then they showed uh, a lower proportion of patient choices. So they became more impatient and steeper discounters. So there seems to be an involvement of the type of, um, well, functions that the DLPFC performs uh, in changing temporal discounting behavior. This kind of makes sense because one of the functions that the DLPFC does perform is inhibition um, and cognitive control. And if you lose cognitive control, it kind of makes sense that your decisions become more impulsive. So this is a very nice story that the um, experimenters tell here that makes sense uh, in terms of what we know about the role of the DLPFC um, from prior research in cognitive neuroscience. There's additional evidence for the involvement of the DLPFC from a study that we had looked at um, previously, namely the Herr et al. study in science. Um, just to remind you, uh, in this study, participants were asked to rate the healthiness of food items, the taste of food items, and then make a decision in a final block about which food item they prefer. And the decisions changed as a function of whether participants were uh, self-controllers or non-self-controllers, right? There was a classification of these participants into self-controllers and non-self-controllers based on their decisions. And it turns out that self-controllers chose more of the liked healthy foods and chose less of the liked unhealthy foods. So self-control really had an effect on liked unhealthy foods here. But the important aspect about the hair study actually in this context involves the role of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And the activity in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex shows a very interesting pattern in this study, um, namely that it shows an enhanced activ uh, activity during trials in which participants actually performed or, or were able to engage in self-control. So self-control trials show an enhanced, enhanced activity, and this enhanced activity actually persists in both groups, in participants that were categorized as self-control participants and those that were categorized as low self-control participants. Still, in the red group, you can see, so the no self-control group, you can see an enhanced activity in the DLPFC when participants engage in self-control relative to when they fail to uh, exhibit self-control. This is uh, important because it implicates the same region, the DLPFC, again in self-control using a different method. So we have converging evidence now that the DLPFC may be involved in self-control. Using additional analyses, then the, the authors continue to suggest that the DLPFC interacts with ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And one way that we could think about this is that there's an inhibitory effect of the DLPFC on the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and which, which actually computes the value. And so if you inhibit the value, um, if you can downturn or downregulate a high value food item because it's actually very healthy, for instance, then that would show that the DLPFC uh, would be able to influence valuation and also decisions through that process. But this part here, I would uh, say, is a bit speculative at this point. <laughs>
Now there's one side note about the DLPFC that I want to add to this. And that is a note on reverse inference. The lateral prefrontal cortex, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, is involved in many things. And to say that it's involved in self-control is maybe going a little bit beyond what the methods can actually argue. So this this kind of area, the, the um, frontal lobe, is involved in many different functions. It, it's involved in, in executive functions and thinking and reasoning, organizing and regulating behavior. It's involved in, in short-term or working memory. It's involved in attention, planning, sequencing. Um, damage to the prefrontal cortex can lead to increased risk-taking. So it's, it's involved in multiple other things other than self-control. And so calling the, uh, well, computations in these prior to study self-control may be going a little bit too far. So be, be aware that there may be some reverse inference involved in, in these types of uh, assignments of function. But um, at, at the very least, what these two experiments are, are doing is that they're making a very reasonable suggestion that a specific part in the, in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex may be involved in inhibiting prepotent behavior that is uh, also related to valuation. So inhibiting something that has a high value on one scale, on, on one attribute, but a very low value on another attribute, for instance.